Howdy, welcome to Osgrave Royalty. I am Justin. In this video on the magician, we'll be continuing our exploration of the mature masculine archetypes brought to us from the King Warrior Magician Lover material from Douglas Gillette and Robert Moore. There are other videos in this series we've covered so far, um, in this season I'm calling it, so check those out on, on my channel. Uh, prior to this, we did a season on the book Archetypes by Dr. Anthony Stevens, which I like to think set the theoretical foundation for what for the uh, practical application that we're now covering in season two. <clears throat> um, any housekeeping materials? I don't think so. So last time we talked about the warrior, and in this episode we'll be chatting about the magician. Um, and I like to say that each archetype that we're covering kind of asks a question. So the king asks, like, what are we building? And the warrior asks, do we have the discipline to build it? The magician asks, how are we going to build it? And then in case you're curious, the lover would ask, do we even want to build it? The magician draws up the blueprints for any project we find ourselves engaged in. They're all about actualizing potential, utilizing the creative energy that flows from the king's vision and gives, giving it a particular structure. Um, yeah, as we said, like the king is like the visionary about what's possible and the magician tries to channel that undefined vision and def make it defined. Um, and we, we talked, so th while the King comes up with this nebulous notion of, of some sort of idea and the magician tries to, tries to conceptualize how it, how it could be done, um, the warrior would be the one that would actually build the damn thing, right? I, I do some, like, stand-up comedy, and I was thinking, like, the magician is like the idea guy, you know? And, uh, you know, there, he could be on a site called, like, Only Plans, where he just comes up with plans that never get never come to fruition, but people donate anyway to hear ideas, only plans, right? And there's maybe comedy gold in there. Probably not. But uh, that's like, that reminds me of like the magician um, just trying to get a wrangle on these um, potential expressions that are, that you're thinking of maybe intentionally or not. Um, so when we're talking about the magician, and I've said this before on the channel, the, the focus of this video series is not on the anthropological, mythological side, even though Moore and Gillette do cover a lot of that. This That's out of scope for my purposes, for my hopes for this video series. So I encourage you all to explore that side of everything on your own. That being said, like the... Uh, studies of anthropology and historical examination of previous cultures that have existed, that, that all those, all that knowledge is informing the formulation of what the, what the archetypes are. Moore and Gillette are using that information and combining it with union archetypal psychology. So that's, they're drawing on that anthropological and symbolic uh, information to inform their discussions here, basically. Uh, later, we'll be talking about the shadow magician inflations, and we've covered the shadow inflations of the other archetypes in the previous videos, which you can check out. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about the role that the magician has in ritual process and in 
their involvement in initiations and transformations. And they're, they're basically the ones that guide people in and out of sacred space, which that's the uh, $10 word for it, but it's basically through tough times. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk all about all this stuff. Um, check out my previous video on um, transformation and the archetype of initiation from season one. Uh, it's about alchemy. It's about the hero's journey and, um, and all that. It, that. I bring all that up because that's really related to the magician archetype. So Moore says of the magician, the magician energy is the archetype of awareness and of insight primarily, but also has knowledge of anything that is not immediately apparent or commonsensical. It is the archetype that governs what is called in psychology the observing ego. Its proper role is to stand back and observe, to scan the horizon, to monitor data coming in from the outside and the inside, and then, out of its wisdom, its knowledge of power within and without, and its technical skill in channeling, make the necessary life decisions. The magician alone does not have the capacity to act. That is the warrior's specialty. But he does have the capacity to think. The magician, then, is the archetype of thoughtfulness and reflection. The magician is the most introverted of the four main archetypes, preferring to dwell on theory and potential and technology. As we've discussed in previous episodes, the archetypes are often more burdened then benefit to one's existence if not working with the archetypes, with the other archetypes in some way. And it's something we've talked about a little bit um, in previous videos, but the thing is, you don't want to be identified with an archetype fully. If you are, you get to be that only plans guy, right? You're the, the idea guy that never does anything with his ideas, but always complains that he has great ideas, but, you know never executes basically that's somebody who whose warrior is undeveloped or maybe they lack the intellectual boundaries to actually solidify a concrete project that comes from the king their inner king energy <clears throat> um or maybe they really they think they want to do it but they really don't when they sit down to it and that would come come from the lover energy but um yeah you want to as a matter of fact, maturity is about distancing yourself from the archetypes. Like, uh, some like uh, the idea guy is immature in this way. He's shadow possessed by the magician. He thinks that coming up with an idea is sufficient for life, but it's not. You have to bring in all these other things. Life is multidimensional. It involves the use of various archetypes to have a good life. You can't just be the idea guy. And like the the most concrete example of this, it has for me is like the warrior. When we talk about the warrior, talk about the workaholic, right? And that's the most concrete example of somebody shadow possessed by an archetype to me. Because we're in 2022, we're in West Western society where you think like, oh, I worked more. Therefore, that is valuable, right? Like, oh, I worked 100 hours, blah, blah, blah. You think that's noble on its own. Anybody can do that. Anybody can, but what are you getting out of it? Why are you doing it? You know, anybody can lift one rock up and move it to another spot and then lift it up and move it back to the original spot. And they can do that all day, every day if they wanted to. But you're not going anywhere. So hard work is meaningless on its own. And I think it's ridiculously overrated uh, in today's society. Uh, like rise and grind and all that nonsense. Um, but again, you don't want to go to the other extreme and just be the idea guy, right? you got to recognize in yourself what, what you need. Um, so... Like, use the warrior to get your ideas rolling. Um, while the lover reminds us to enjoy life, like to, to go and touch grass, as the kids say. 
And finally, the magician is best when tethered to the, to the vision of one's king energy, what's called the transcendent other. It's that calling that keeps one energized. When your magician is in tune with that, you can really start breaking down the grand vision into executable steps. And Moore calls the magician in his optimized state a shaman. And the reasons for that are anthropological. And we've all heard the role of shamans and their role in primitive tribes. And we've heard of the medicine man and the witch doctor. They were tribal elders and healers, the old wise men. And it's this aspect of the magician that we now turn. Note that I'll be using the terms magician and shaman interchangeably. Um, but just know that the shaman is the optimized version of, of the magician. Uh, so let's quickly run through the two types of sacred space, liminoid and liminal. Liminoid space represents our ordinary world, our nine to five, fast food, casually chatting with friends, etc. It's our day to day. Liminal space, on the other hand, represents the extraordinary world. Moore has a good passage about this. Um, <clears throat> there is no way to live a human life without occasional excursions into the extraordinary reality. Ancient peoples were aware of this, and they ritualized their crazy time hedging it around with ceremony and physical and psychological boundaries. When a person suffered a loss, he was made taboo. His neighbors avoided him. They knew he was likely to be acting erratically and so wanted no part of his energy. After all, he was particularly susceptible to being possessed by animal spirits. By these means, the energy was contained so that it could be transformed with the help of a tribal shaman into a regenerative energy rather than a destructive one. Inadequate insulation of the ego and inadequate management of these powerful forces and sacred reality led to a chronic liminality and insanity. Furthermore, from a psychological perspective, liminal space is initially de deconstructive. It dissolves our previous expectations as to ways of experiencing ourselves and our relationship to the world. Then it offers us a new vision of ourselves and our relationships. We are regenerated, recreated, almost from the bottom up, <clears throat> as new, more fully integrated and mature people. Sacred space and time always carry a charge of libido. Liminoid space, on the other hand, um, may refresh us and recharge our batteries, but it will not transform us. Idyllic vacations take place in a kind of liminoid space. They are truly out of the ordinary, but do nothing to change our lives. And um, historically, as mentioned above, journeys into and out of liminal space was contained and managed by ritual elders. Not only that, but the tribe viewed such journeys as acceptable and understandable. No one was shamed when they were going through a crazy time. It was known that should the person survive it, they'll come out of it transformed and thus benefit the tribe. The this is the true value of the magician archetype, of the shaman. Transforming the world by managing the sacred space in societies, individual by individual. This is incredibly important. This is how the ma magician archetype affects society directly. And I, you know, it's easy to laugh at the primitives and their, you know, inferior technology and all this, but can you imagine in America in 2022, like a sort of practice where people are made taboo? when they're going through a crazy time, you know? Now it's like, well, who's going to cover the shift? What, you you think you can, you only, what, you're only willing to work when life is good? Life isn't fair, man. You know, man up, get over it. Move on. 
Life is tough. Develop a thick skin, you weak POS, and clock into your shift and grind. You think life is easy? Grind. Doesn't matter what you're going through. I don't care. Stop crying and move forward. Like, can you imagine? Like, no, I'm going through a crazy time right now. Can you please give me some space? Like, in our society? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, I don't know. In some ways, that practice seems culturally advanced. And, like, you know, people, I don't it's a very materialist society right now. People going through hard times, like, people don't have any empathy, typically, for one another. Maybe sympathy, but not much empathy. And there are probably biological reasons for that, having to do with the rise of single mother households and uh, lack of the father. And fathers are shown to actually be the uh, driver for developing empathy in individuals. And uh, if you miss that window in childhood development, it's really hard to develop it as people get older. Um, also comes from like the Puritan work ethic. And uh, read Max Weber, his book, uh, The Protestant Work Ethic and, sorry, Protestant Work Ethic and The Spirit of Capitalism. Really good book about, it's really about how your beliefs make your make the world and society around you. But it's examining how Protestantism and capitalism kind of work hand in hand. Um, anyway, just kind of a rant there. Um, so if an experience is deeply moving, but not fundamentally transformative, it is liminoid space. And this is like a reason people turn to drugs and alcohol. They're trying to attempt to access a liminal space. And so what happens with addicts, they can get struck stuck in what's called chronic liminality or really like pseudo liminality. But, um, so Check this out, a passage from Moore. An individual is caught forever in limbo, unable to pull himself back together to resume life in the world. Such a man returns to the mundane world with some enhanced consciousness and internal alpha male status, but no sense of his own limitations. He walks and talks among us, but we can look in his eyes and see he is caught in that other world. His eyes are glazed. They bear an unnatural light. They may carry even a godlike aura around them, but they are not humble. They are the eyes of a man whose ego has been overcooked. Sooner or later, such a man as this will fall. And on the other hand, if he leaves too early, he may be undercooked. He is the man who goes to see a therapist after some crisis, has a few useful insights, and then quits, believing himself to be now back on track. Sooner or later, he will end up in the consulting room again after another crisis on the same problems. And overcooked and undercooked are like my new favorite terms right now. They're alchemical terms. I just love them because they're very useful and practical in describing very abstract things. Again, see my previous videos for explanations on that. Um... And the alchemical process shares characteristics with initiations and transformation and also the uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which is really a narrative manifestation of the alchemical process. So I love the idea of somebody who thinks alchemy is a ridiculous, esoteric, uh, anachronistic practice, but absolutely loves the hero's journey because he heard about how Campbell and Lucas came up with, you know, Star Wars and thinks that's cool, but laughs at alchemy. Um, that's an interesting individual, I would say. Um, there, okay, so let's talk about. Okay, yeah, there. Again, I've said this in previous videos, but just just in case you don't know, I'm not an authority on any of this. I'm what I I would call myself an enthusiastic fan. So if you Love, if you want to find out more about these subjects, please don't take my word for it. I'm covering from a biased perspective what I think is valuable that you might. This is, these are things that I love. I'm going to get things wrong. 
I'm an amateur. I'm just a fan. Um, but there's each of these topics are in, insanely dense, and there's plenty of further reading to do that. So I'm just trying to introduce the topic with on your behalf. So let's talk about the shadow magicians, the innocent one and the trickster, what Moore and Gillette call them. Moore says, we call the passive pole of the magician shadow the innocent. The active one would be the trickster. The innocence of the shadow magician is always feigned. Just as the king's weakling is dishonest about his tyrannical impulses, and the warrior's masochist disguises his sadistic aggressive impulses. Barely concealed beneath the innocence repression barrier is terrific cunning and technically refined manipulative skills. The innocent only appears to be ignorant. The man possessed by the innocent claims not to understand himself, his relationships, dy relationship dynamics, or the consequences of his behavior. He believes there to be no magician energy residing within him and he projects his manipulative shadow onto others. As far as he can see, the world is out to get him. On the other hand, there's the trickster. Men possessed by the trickster are detached from the common concern for the welfare of others. The trickster differs from the innocent in that he generally recognizes his manipulative skills and revels in them. He often tricks others into believing lies about his effectiveness or power. Um, I think of like the sophists from, or the sophists from uh, the days of Socrates when he was talking to subject matter experts, so-called. Or you could think of them as pundits or influencers now, nowadays. Uh, Moore explains that the narcissistic personality disorder, disorder falls under this category. We've talked about that some on the channel. I have a video about it in the, from the last season. I have... Uh, yeah. Uh, again, to be clear, <clears throat> either you're accessing the magician consciously in a healthy way, or you definitely are being possessed by one of these shadow possessions. Again, like I've said this before, that to ha have a goal of perfect health is fine, even though everyone understands nobody will ever be in perfect health. There's always some way you can improve. But does that mean it's not a noble goal to strive for? Absolutely not. In the same way, you're probably going to be possessed somewhat by the shadow possessions of the various archetypes. Does that mean trying to become a shaman or an ideal magician is a poor goal? Absolutely not. I wanted to say earlier too, I forgot to mention it, when people are going through their crazy time, uh, there's a movie called The Weatherman. I think it's pretty underrated with Nicolas Cage. Um, that's a character, I think, who's stuck in liminal space. Um, I think that's a good example. So check that out. Um, so. Just re reviewing my notes here. Moore asserts that our modern age is, and he's writing in the late 80s, early 90s-ish, it's the age of the shadow magician. Sophists, politi politicians, influencers, etc. They tend to hold our projections and they're thriving. Like we outsource our thinking to the popular people. It's like high school. Um, yeah, it's just like, I don't need to think because this person's thinking well enough and I'm never, I'll just let him do the thinking, you know? So let's examine some characteristics of, of a shaman, uh, like the ideal state. In traditional societies, the shaman always had a larger worldview. Thus, the modern, who is adequately accessing his shamanistic potentials, will have a wide-ranging interest, will have wide-ranging interests. He will be deeply com concerned about society as a whole, about his planet. He will be seeking ways to implement the moral application of his insights in different areas, legal, political, philosophical, scientific. He is the kind of man who is committed to an inclusive community, joining and leading other citizens in their efforts 
to fight global warming, world hunger, pollution, the destruction of the ozone layer, and other planetary problems. Now, as an anarcho-capitalist, I hear those, and we probably differ politically, but I like the, that last one, other planetary problems. Yeah, <laughs> uh, The other stuff, uh, you know, that's a different topic, but it just... I got to represent my anarcho-capitalist leanings here. Uh, that sort of uh, language about fighting pollution and stuff ruffles my feathers a little bit because there's a lot of dark stuff that can be tied with tied to that. But I just wanted to throw that just in tangent out there. So to continue, because his ultimate goal in whatever career he follows and other planetary, sorry, uh, and other career, in whatever career he follows, is to contribute to healing through stewarding his knowledge. The contemporary shaman keeps abreast of the latest developments in his area of specialty and in general human knowledge too. He doesn't believe that his education ends with his last year of school, but continues to study uh, in his area of interest for the whole of his life. Kind of reminds me like of that saying, you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Um, he explains that while technical experts are engaging with the magician archetype, it is not enough to only be an expert in one field. Moore admits that we are definitely encouraged to be myopic in our, in our society, however. And this hits home for me because I work in tech, I've done stand-up, I've made electronic music, and I think like I'm doing YouTube... I'm learning Unity, I'm going to make a video game, I want to make a JRPG at some point, i got to write a story, learn about uh, how to write a good screenplay, storyboard, I've done pixel art, done all kinds of things, and I'm like super self-conscious like and envious of my friends who are like, no, I just love programming, that's my thing, I love it, and all their energy can go into that, I'm like, God, I envy you. Um, cause I could be a, I could be a force if I were just focused on one thing, but I just, I love the interdisciplinary connections. I mean, we're all built different, right? So, um, another aspect of the shaman are his abilities of empathy and healing because of his own experiences with extraordinary space. This man values the psychological spaces of other people. He appreciates their various ways of picturing themselves, uh, their own joys and pains, their hopes and fears, and by doing so, he helps to lead them through these inner spaces. And the very act of beholding a person helps them to heal, mirror, and contain him. And the modern shaman does an excellent job beholding others. Most of us, tragically, have had our inner worlds devalued, criticized, or ignored by our parents, or our unhealthy relationships. The contemporary shaman, however, helps us feel to helps us to feel worthwhile and validated by listening to us and empathizing with our position. In short, he offers empathetic attunement. This man will be devoted to helping himself and others arrive at the truth in any given situation. In conclusion, Moore says, the most important issue, therefore, is how we use our magician potentials. Are we stewarding them for the health of both selfhood and community, or are we allowing them to possess us and push us under the influence of the shadow magician? There's so much to say on this topic. Think of all the characters in movies, and let me know in the comments below who you think might embody some of these shadow uh, possessions of the magician, or who could be shamans, like uh, I think of Dumbledore as a shaman uh, archetype kind of character. Um, or, played by the same actor, the prisoner in Count of Monte Cristo. Um, anyway, hope you all got something out of this. I find all this fascinating. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Next in the series of Mature Masculine Archetypes will be The Lover. Uh, that'll be the final strict fourth one although far from the last one in the series but anyway either way i'll catch you all in the next one let me know in the comments below look forward to conversing with you and take care have a good one Bye bye